I think uh, in terms of new Eddie Waring, you see, Eddie, Eddie Waring, um, I think the book's still available. If anybody wants to have a dig around online, I'm sure you'll find it for about 50 pence here and there all over the place because it came out in 2008. Um, but I think it's, even since 2008, we do have a lot more Eddie Waring's going around, as, as Phil's just saying there, I think, in terms of Ruby Lee popping up on BBC Breakfast and things like that. Those sorts of people are around. And, and back in the day, it was Eddie, really, who got us on terrestrial television. In fact, he did. Um, and he, he was like the, the highest profile figure. Now, that came with baggage because they had the sort of stereotypical Northern comedian persona. So it, it, some people obviously got very upset about that. Others just saw it for what it was. Uh, that's certainly the way I saw it, is that he got us onto the into shows like It's a Knockout, which were huge, and then everybody's front room. And then it, having got that sort of attention, it's up to the game itself then to reinvent itself if it wants. So it's, it's just too easy to blame Eddie Waring for that, I think. Um, but yeah, he's um, it, it was a real character. There's no question about that. And also, his story was basically the story of rugby league up until he died in the 1980s. Um, you could trace it right the way back. He's... he's his parents, for example, in the same room as people who'd been in the George Hotel in 1895. And, uh, his brother went to the first Wembley Cup final in 1929, and he'd been to goodness knows what else. But what he would think about today's game is he would be very much in favour of all the modernising. He would definitely be chasing up streaming, since it was Eddie who was behind trying to get us on television in the first place via his trips to America. He would have been a huge Toronto Wolfpack fan, no question about that. It would definitely have been in favour of that sort of stuff. Uh, and more besides, I think what he would have said in terms of where the game is now, um, I flatter myself to think he would have a, had a similar sort of view of it to me, insofar as he was always one for expanding the game, as I've always been, and sort of banging the drum for what it could be. Well, but at the same time, understood that the game was very tied close to its original northern communities. You have to respect that, and you have to deal with that politically if you're going to take the game anywhere. Um, his big thing was if you're going to expand in this country, do it by degrees. So get down to Doncaster, um, concentrate up in Cumbria, get it into the northeast, place like Newcastle, for example, Mike. You know that that sort of that sort of carry on. That was Eddie all over. So I think were he around at this time now, we'd, sort of half of him would be excited, and the other half would be sort of yelling at the people in power. The difference between Eddie and me, of course, is Eddie would have actually been round there to Red Hall, and it'd be in, it'd be in the in with the executives sort of telling them off face to face. Except he wouldn't, he'd have been in the Queen's Hotel. Yeah, well, they'd um, have gone to the Queen's, wouldn't they? That's <laughs> they'd, be going to, <laughs> they'd be going to see him. I think they, one, they learnt loads of things from, from, from Tony's book, because we all think we know, those of us of a certain age, Eddie from, from his persona on the television. But I think what knocked me out was the beginning of his story, where he actually was an, an entrepreneur before he even became a broadcaster where he could see opportunity. Now, he, he, you know, getting onto the 1946 Indomitables tour w was massive. You know, he, he was the journalist that all of the players trusted. He was the guy that brought back films of it and went around the cinemas and, uh, and gave you an insight into what had happened. He, he was the guy that in, in Dewsbury, you know, added the Black Knights to the junior team, you know, almost, what, two generations before... You know, Huddersfield became Barracudas. He 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 genuinely was the Peter Deakin of his day. To to you know to to coin a, an analogy that may not be fair to either of them, but what he saw was opportunity, um, and he was very much at the forefront of it. So much more than just a guy who picked up a microphone when when Grandstand was on. No, he's just a great character and good fun. And if you can get yourself a copy somewhere. You know, I think people would enjoy it now You because it does teach a little bit about the history of the sport, but also it, it really opens Eddie up, I hope, I hope it does anyway, as a, as a human being and a rounded figure. Because what he was basically, as well as being an entrepreneur, was a, an entertainer. I mean, growing up, he wanted to be on the stage. And you know, I think it, it, given a choice, he would have been a singer, really, which then accounts for him acting the way he does when he gets on with Markham and Wise. And um, as I say, it's a knockout and things. That's showman in him tended to come out. Um, and it, of course, it wasn't just that. He also sort of got all the impressionists going because it was such a distinctive voice that he had. It wasn't really a northern voice, was it really? There's tinges of northernness in it, obviously, but it's ever so slightly bizarre. Um, and of course, that got noticed by people like Mike Yarwood and the Goodies and Monty Python and these sorts of people. So um, it, it was great for rugby league, I think. But 
it did come with that image thing attached, which I think, uh, I was going to say the game's even now struggling to shake off, but do you know what? I think it sort of is really. Do you? What do you think, Phil? I, I, I'm not quite sure that nowadays rugby league does have, have that same image to quite the same extent. Well, well again, I, I think the, the nearest point of reference is looking at Kevin Sinfield last night. And I, I know we keep going back to, to something, but, you know, turns up uh, in, in a major television presentation in a three-piece suit, looking very much like Jordan Henderson did when he was on the stage before him, talks in an accent that is a hint of Northern, but clearly is not your traditional um, stereotypical caricature type northern accent that so many people might still associate with the game that that don't follow it and looks very much like a modern professional sportsman it doesn't look like a 17 stone prop forward uh, who comes from Halifax and speaks a certain way mm-hmm. um, and, and I think yeah that's that's the that full-time professional professionalism has brought us a, a different type of character that we do need to capitalize on that they do stand um, you know, uh, absolute scrutiny with the, the best of the rest, and and it isn't any more about purely being a northern stereotype. It is about being, um, you know, the the consummate professional in whatever sport you happen to play. And it's actually moved us on a little bit from even the recent past with Eddie and Steve-O because they would face the same sort mm-hmm. of criticisms, wouldn't they? That that were thrown at Eddie Waring, and there are a lot of similarities between Steve-O and Eddie Waring, not. Not least the fact that both from Dewsbury, um, but over and above all that, they, they did get the same criticism, as indeed did Barry and Terry shortly after as well. But I do think that the game sort of managed to reinvent itself quite nicely. Well, Brian, that... Brian Carney uh, again is you know the complete opposite to who you would normally think would front rugby league. I think the the grand final coverage on Sky with John Wilkin, with Danny Maguire, with Jason Robinson, all held together by. Brian Carney, even probably three or four years ago, you wouldn't have thought that. That, that is a very dynamic, modern image that, again, we should be building on. <laughs>